Are you searching for answers to difficult family issues? Then you will be blessed by Counsel for the Heart, a program that brings hope and encouragement to the family. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Join Junie Lawson, Bible instructor for White Horse Media, in today's program titled, Parenting Teenagers. Welcome to Counsel for the Heart. I'm Junie Lawson with White Horse Media. In this series, we'll discuss issues that affect the family. My goal is to inspire faith, hope, and courage in facing life's challenges. I plan to share with you from my own personal experience, as well as my experience as a Bible instructor for the past 18 years. Many times while giving a Bible study, I've had the opportunity to help others with their problems through sharing from my experience and through following Bible principles and guidelines. As we near the second coming of Jesus, Satan is increasing his attack on the family. It is my hope and sincere prayer that this series will provide tools that will be a benefit and a blessing to you and your family and give you hope and courage to press on to that great day. Parenting is a serious responsibility. Even very young children can cause some problems. As most parents know, from the time a child is born, they set out to get their own way and control their little world. I like the title that Dr. James Dobson gives to one of his books. You've probably heard of it, Parenting Isn't for Cowards. I like that idea, but if you're not a coward, that means you must be very courageous and have much wisdom. It definitely takes courage and wisdom to be a godly parent. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that there are many whose children are grown now who feel like they failed miserably in the area of parenting, especially when their children were in their teens. But before we continue with today's program, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, today we take on the concept of parenting teenagers. Lord, you know more about rebellion than we do because you have had all in rebellion against you. But Father, we ask today for heavenly wisdom that you will inspire us through this program. You will teach us. You will help us. Please give me freedom with my words. Help me to be able to share the concepts. And I pray that you will minister to those who are watching, that they will be helped, encouraged, and inspired. In Jesus' name. Amen. In today's program, we've chosen to specifically address parenting teenagers. My husband and I have been there, and we know a little something about the challenges that may occur. Well, not one of us has all the answers, but we do have some experiences, and we do have lessons, and we do have some concepts that we can share to help others who are now passing down that road. The Bible tells us that our children are God's gifts to us. And that is certainly true. They are precious to us. We can recall many joyful memories memories with our children when they were young. However, I know that sometimes these precious gifts can bring much distress and even grief to our lives when they enter into a time of trouble in their life, a time of rebellion. Some homes today have become war zones with raging battles going on. Rarely do we read good news in the paper about the youth in our communities, but we know that there are good deeds being done by our youth. We also know that God is raising up an army of young people that are committed to serve Him rather than the God of this world. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, one of the signs of the last days is disobedience to parents. In the past century, it seems that this prophecy has been fulfilled in a way that it has not been in any other time in history. People are asking, what's wrong with kids today? And rightly so. Among the young people of this age are those who are disrespectful, angry, violent, defiant, involved with drugs and or alcohol, breaking the law, dabbling in the occult, and a variety of other frightening scenarios. However, we must remember that we're all born into a world with a rebellious heart. All of us have a rebellious heart when we're born. We have a desire to do it and have it our own way. 
Not always, but all too frequently, the sin of the children lies at the door of their parents. I read a statement recently that said, raising a teenager is like trying to nail jello to a tree. Have you tried that? Well, obviously it's an impossible task, but I like the concept. The illustration is a good one. Another one I remember was the suggestion that when your child turns 12 years old, you put them in a barrel with a hole in it and you feed them through the hole. And then when they turn, become a teenager, you plug the hole. And of course, we wouldn't really want to do that. But the, the idea illustrates the frustration that parents often feel in dealing with their teenagers. What training do the majority of people have for their parenting techniques? Well, for the most part, none. Most of us parent in the same way that we were parented when we were children. Whether that was good or bad, that was our training ground. Some didn't like the way that they were dealt with when they were young, so they're looking for new philosophies. Some will become more liberal than their parents. Some will become more conservative. Why do young people reject their parents' values? How do you parent a child who seemingly doesn't want to be parented? It's obvious that we need help in raising and guiding our young people today. Where do we go to find that help? Do we use medication, tough love, counseling, punishment? What is the answer? What has changed since our parents were growing up? If you can think back that far, what was happening 50 years ago? What were kids getting into trouble in school for 50 years ago? In the 50s, let's say. What were they getting into trouble for? Well, let's see, they were getting out of line, chewing gum, throwing spit wads, passing notes, you know, terrifying things like that. Well, those were really innocent activities from our perspective now, but at that time they were significant and they were to obey and um, toe the line, as we would say. Would anyone even consider those to be a problem in our schools today? Not at all, of course not. School, then, was a safe place, a place where you could get educated, spend time with your friends, and enjoy your life. That isn't to say that there wasn't any mischief going on, but for the most part, it was harmless, and school was still a safe place. Television was getting well-established in the American homes in the 50s. You may remember some of the programs of that era. There was I Love Lucy, The Bob Hope Show, Captain Kangaroo, Gunsmoke, Leave it to Beaver, Ozzie and Harriet, to name a few. In December 1958, Edward R. Murrow wrote in TV Guide this statement, viewers must recognize television in the main is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us. Mr. Murrow was a most distinguished and renowned figure in the history of American broadcast journalism. And I see his comments as still being relevant today, don't you? What about the music of the 50s? Some of the hit songs were titled, Come Softly to Me, Love Letters in the Sand, Honeycomb, Party Doll, It's Only Make Believe, Sixteen Candles, and At the Hop. I can remember most of those. How about you? In researching for this topic, I came across the top 10 Billboard rap songs. I won't read any of the words because I can tell you what I read chilled me to the bone. A previous article I read about a female jogger in New York City in Central Park, was, she was gang raped and beaten to death by a group of teenage boys. Later it was found that these boys had listened to and were chanting a certain rap song with demonic words that motivate them in this brutal attack. It's sickening and frightening to realize how young people are being programmed, not just to sex, but violent sex, hatred, racism, drugs, and murder. Gradually, over time, as TV programs, music, and video games have grown more explicit in the areas of sex, violence, and foul language, America and the world has become desensitized 
to its evil effects. I recently read about a children's movie that is based on anti-religious themes whose ultimate goal is to bash Christianity and promote atheism in the minds of the children. For a number of years now, we've seen an amoral philosophy creeping into our public education system, in some cases, even into our Christian schools. Our children and youth are being educated to believe that there are no moral absolutes, that the law of God is out of date, and that everything is relative. They're led to believe that what matters is how I feel about what is right and wrong. Parents need to begin early to build a strong hedge against the postmodern thinking that permeates our educational system. We're going to take a short break, but don't go away. Welcome back to Counsel for the Heart and today's program titled Parenting Teenagers. We've been talking about some of the challenges that teenagers experience today as opposed to those of 50 years ago. Let's continue. A recent study performed by the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse had surprising results. It revealed that many parents were clueless in regard to their children's involvement in the use of illegal drugs and alcohol. It found that girls ages 12 to 17 were equal or higher risk for substance abuse than boys. The survey showed that teenage exposure to alcohol, various drugs, including cocaine and heroin, and violence. Further research found that by age 17, one in four teenagers will have known someone who was a victim of gun violence. Isn't that frightening? The study revealed that the transition stage at 13 or 14 years old is a particularly vulnerable time as young people move into high school and attain the freedom that goes with it. Today, we hear a lot about the rights of the child. When a child is suffering mental, physical, or sexual abuse in their home, we're first to, be, to want somebody to be there to protect that child and, if necessary, take them out of the home. However, there is a danger of heavy government involvement in the home. When the child's supposed best interests are determined by the government without the consent of the parents, then there's a serious breakdown in the family unit. Young people may interpret this to mean that it is not necessary for them to, to respect the authority of their parents. Who would have thought that in one brief generation it would be considered taboo to spank our children for their disobedience. Proverbs 13.24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. As parents, we should not be afraid of what people think, but follow the Bible counsel. And yet at the same time, when we realize these Bible principles and understand them correctly, we know that discipline is always to be done in love, never in anger. If a child doesn't learn to be respectful and obedient while they're young, their willfulness and their temper tantrums will only increase as they grow older. By the time they're teens, they can be out of control, raging with anger and temper tantrums. This could be particularly a bad situation if you had a young, strong male teenager who was out of control perhaps with a single mom as his parent. In today's world, many young people have already transferred their allegiance from their parents to their peers. The rights of the child further separates children from the sense of closeness and trust that they would have in the family unit. What do you do with your rebellious teen? Do you kick them out? Turn the other way? Do you turn them in? We're going to talk now about 13 suggestions for you to consider prayerfully. Number one, respect. Treat your children with respect. For example, let's say you have a shoes off policy in your home. A visitor, the neighbor, comes over to visit and he has his shoes on. He doesn't think to take them off. And you'd say to him, hey, Joe, if you don't mind, 
we have a shoes off policy here because we have this light colored carpet, so would you mind leaving your shoes by the door? Oh, no problem, he says. But on the other hand, a parent might say to their child, particularly their teenager, they might say, Bobby, get those shoes off. Don't you have a brain in your head? Don't you know we have a shoes off policy here? Well, which one of those attitudes do you think would show respect to your teen? We want to be careful about the way we talk to them, don't we? Number two is praise. Try to weave a little bit of praise into your child's life every day. Praise them for doing their homework, for doing their chores, for cleaning the cat box, anything you can think of. Weave praise in because giving that praise will help nourish and nurture them and their needs. Number three, play. Have fun with your kids. Do some things that they enjoy. Take a vacation, go camping together, be involved in their lives. Yes, even during the times when they're rebelling. Because even though they're in rebellion, those positive times that you spend with them will still help you to bond and nurture them and will give them memories in the future that they can look back on. Four, arguments. When you're holding a conversation with your teen, by God's grace, don't let it escalate into an argument. That never accomplishes anything. It's so important that we remain calm and patient. If you get into an argument, it can easily deteriorate into a shouting match, in which you may walk away or just feel defeated. If you're able to make a decision in advance and stick to your guns on this and determine that you'll never raise your voice, that's good, but I don't know about you. For me, it took a lot of prayer. When my daughter was a teen and going through her toughest times, we had some discussions that did seem to escalate in volume a few times. And when that happened, I felt really bad. I would go upstairs to my room and pray and cry and say, God, I don't want to raise my voice at her because I'm not representing Jesus when I do that. So I asked God if he would help me. Several times this scenario repeated itself until finally there I was on my knees again. And by the way, every time I raised my voice at her, I, the Holy Spirit impressed me. I went back down to her room and asked her to forgive me for raising my voice. She didn't apologize, but that's okay. I did my part. So I asked God if he would give me a promise that I could claim and he would give me victory. And he did. James um, 1, 19 and 20 says, Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I made it personal by saying, in my mind, I would say, Be quick to listen, Lord. Help me be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of Juni does not produce the righteousness of God. And he does give victory when we call on him. Number five, choose your battles. Don't major in minors. Be very careful. Don't bother to fight a battle you can't win anyway. Pick them carefully. Nobody likes battles, but if you have to have one, at least make sure it's worthwhile. Six, natural consequences. If we allow the children to experience the natural consequences of their behaviors, they're more likely to self-correct. Here's a simple example of Bobby who got a new mountain bike for his birthday and he continually left it in the driveway. His parents kept reminding him, don't leave it in the driveway. It could, somebody could accidentally run over it, but he didn't seem to remember. And finally, one day, quite by accident, his father backed his truck over the bike and made quite a mess out of it. And of course, Bobby was devastated, as were his parents. They were sorry too, but they didn't rush out to buy him another bike. They told him that he would now have to earn the money himself to buy another bike and that he would learn through this to be more responsible. So there are many ways that we can allow the children to self-correct through this means. Seven, be consistent. When you've set up guidelines for your home and your children, be sure to follow through. Be consistent. If you change the rules from week to week, the children will interpret that as weakness. They'll think that rules are made to be changed or broken according to their will. Number eight, demonstrate unconditional love. 
no matter what happens, no matter how they dress, what they say, what they do. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the love of Christ that brings us to repentance, and it's the love of Christ seen in us that will bring rebellious teenagers to repentance. And remember the wise words of a man who said, no matter what happens, may they always remember how kind you were. And nine, keep them home. If at all possible, keep them under your roof. Even if they're rebelling, if they're involved with drugs, it's much better to keep them under your roof where you still have some influence over them, where you can care for them physically as far as possible, than to have them be out on the streets where only God knows what might happen to them. In the last segment, we talked about some suggestions for you to consider in raising your teens, and I'd like to continue with a few more points. Number 10, listening. In an adult conversation, we tend to ask each other questions in the process of getting acquainted or getting to know how was your day, what happened, you know, asking some questions like that. But sometimes when we ask questions of our teenagers, they feel like they're being interrogated. And so in order to avoid that, it would be helpful to try to have a more casual setting where you just talk back and forth and do more listening than, um, than asking so many questions. We don't want them to feel like we're prying into their personal affairs. Then maybe they'll be more willing to open up and share some of those things with us. Sometimes it's difficult for us as parents to really listen to what our kids are trying to say. I wish that I had put more effort into listening when my daughter was a teen. Recently, I was talking with a young teenage daughter of a friend, and actually, I was mostly listening. She was doing the talking, and I was listening. And I was just hearing what she was saying and trying to communicate that I heard what she said. And after a little while, she turned to me and she said, thank you for caring and for listening. She said, I wish my mom would listen to what I'm saying. And it isn't that her mom doesn't listen, but sometimes we don't listen and give our full attention so that they really know that we're caring about what they say and are caring about their feelings. Number 11, counseling. Don't hesitate to seek out counseling if you feel like you have issues that are bigger than you can handle. Many good qualified counselors are out there to help you. 12, Take advantage of the many wonderful books and DVDs that talk about and deal with the subject of parenting teens. Learn from others who can, who've already traveled this road and can give you good counsel. There are no perfect parents and no perfect children, but we can strive to do our best with God's help and we will have success. Number 13, last but certainly not least, pray and claim God's promises. I love the words of Jesus in Acts 26, 18. Open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. A precious promise we can claim for our teenagers. In Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17, this comforts a lot of parents' hearts. Thus saith the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in your end, saith the Lord, that your children shall come again to their own border. James 1 verse 5, again, this is such an important promise. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally, and it will be given him. And finally, Hosea 2, verse 6, I will hedge up her way with thorns and build a wall against her so she cannot find her paths. If you're concerned that your teens are going down the wrong path, ask God to build that wall to prevent them from going down that path. In closing, I want to share with you a poem. This is by an anonymous author. I had the meanest mother in the world. While other kids had candy, or breakfast. For breakfast, I had to eat cereal, eggs, and toast. While other kids had cake and candy for lunch, I had a sandwich. As you can guess, my dinner was different from the other kids too. 
my mother insisted on knowing where we were all the time. She had to know who our friends were and what we were doing. I was ashamed to admit it, but she actually had the nerve to break the child labor law. She made us work. We had to wash dishes, make beds, and learn how to cook. That woman must have stayed awake nights thinking up things for us kids to do. And she insisted we tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. By the time we became teenagers, she was much wiser, and our life became more unbearable. None of this tooting the car, the, the car horn for us to come running. She embarrassed us to no end by insisting that our friends come to the front door to get us. I forgot to mention that most of our friends were allowed to date at the mature age of 12 or 13. But our old-fashioned mother refused to let us date until we were 15. She really raised a bunch of squares. None of us were ever arrested for shoplifting or busted for dope. And who do you think we have to thank for this? You're right, our mean mother. I'm trying to raise my children to stand a little straighter and taller, and I'm secretly tickled to pieces when my children call me mean. I thank God for giving me the meanest mother in the world. The world needs more mean mothers like mine. Well, I think you get the point. I hope today's program has been an encouragement to you in parenting your teens. Surely there is no responsibility that is greater than this one or more important, and God will help you and bless you.